Hi, this is the uh, second uh, in my series of uh, big picture lectures on constitutional law. In the first lecture, I explained that the theme of this series of lectures is to ask and try to answer the question, to what extent is the UK constitution essentially uh, flexible in the sense that it um, can bend and can be shaped by uh, whatever legislation is on the statute book at any given point in time? And to what extent does the Constitution have durable or fixed content of the type that sets parameters and that may mean that certain aspects of the Constitution are either non-negotiable or are at least uh, resistant to uh, change? I want to um, focus on that question uh, in this lecture by asking it uh, in particular in relation to judicial review. So I want to ask the question, to what extent is judicial review up for grabs? And by that, I mean, to what extent is judicial review something that is a given, something that, that has to be there within our constitutional system? Or is judicial review merely something that exists on the terms and for as long as it is tolerated by um, Parliament. That leads on to the question, to what extent can politicians, who often find themselves on the receiving end of adverse judicial review decisions by the courts, to what extent can they get rid of, or alter, or weaken judicial review, if they so wish? This is not simply a, an academic question because, as we'll see, it's very much a live issue at the moment as a result of the uh, independent review of administrative law that recently reported and in the light of the government's uh, initial response to the review. Now, on any question like this about the UK constitution, the issue of parliamentary sovereignty inevitably looms large. So let me be begin by reminding you of what Dicey said about sovereignty. Um, this, if you like, is, is the, uh, the classical statement of the orthodox uh, view. Dicey said that the sovereignty of parliament is, from a legal point of view, the dominant characteristic of our political institutions. It means neither more nor less than this. That Parliament has the right to make or unmake any law whatever, and that no person or body is recognised by the law as having a right to override or set aside the legislation of Parliament. So Dicey is advancing here two essentially complementary propositions, two arguments that together form uh, different sides of the same coin. So on the one hand, he's saying that Parliament can do as it wishes, it can make any law it wants. And on the other hand, nobody can stop it from doing that. And that would mean, among other things, that courts can't interfere uh, because they have uh, some kind of objection, even a constitutional objection, to a law that Parliament has made. So in considering this question about judicial review and about whether or not it is a durable feature of the Constitution, a question inevitably arises about the extent, if any, to which judicial review is able to withstand legislation enacted by Parliament that may attempt to unpick it or remove it or uh, operate in any other way upon it. So with those points, uh, those preliminary points in mind, uh, let me just outline three uh, issues that I want to consider in this lecture. First, I'll say a little bit about the independent review of administrative law that reported in March 2021 and about the government's reaction uh, to it. I'll argue that certainly in the, um, the, the, the government's response, there is, um, it would appear, a clear assumption that judicial review is up for grabs and is vulnerable to any limitations or changes that Parliament might choose to enact. 
I'll then go on to consider particular proposals put forward by the government in relation to the concept of nullity, um, and I'll explain what that means uh, later. And I'll also explain that I think that the government's proposals there have some significant rule of law implications. And then finally in this lecture, I'll turn to the question of ouster clauses, uh, and we'll look both at, at what the government had to say about that in its response to the uh, independent review of administrative law, and we'll look to at, at one of the leading judicial decisions in this area. And in doing that, I want to try to uh, really get to the bottom of the question of where, if at all, is the constitutional bedrock here? Are there, uh, do we reach a point at which the court will say to Parliament that actually um, it isn't open to it to interfere with judicial review? Or, as I asked earlier, is all of this entirely up for grabs? Is it all entirely subject to whatever Parliament chooses to legislate? So let me start by saying a couple of general things about the independent review. When the terms of reference for the review were published, it appeared that the government contemplated a report that might make some really, uh, really wide ranging um, recommendations, including such things as codifying the grounds of judicial review, which might involve uh, limiting them or even removing some of them. Um, it envisaged the possible possibility of restricting justiciability, that is the range of, of, of issues that courts are allowed to consider in these cases. It contemplated limiting the effect of remedies, including by manipulating the concept of nullity, to which I'll turn in a moment. It also envisaged narrowing the scope of what's called collateral challenge, whereby unlawful administrative decisions can be questioned indirectly in criminal and private law uh, proceedings. It uh, considered the possibility or it uh, envisaged the possibility of limiting the rules on standing to prevent uh, certain parties from bringing uh, judicial review claims and also the possibility of restricting rights of appeal. So certainly in the terms of reference the government set, um, there was, it, it seemed to be the case that there was in contemplation a pretty wide set of changes to the law of judicial review. Now, in fact, the report that the independent review produced was a very measured and balanced uh, report and the recommendations that it made were pretty uh, modest. In the report, um, the authors said that the government is undoubtedly entitled to legislate in relation to judicial review and may well be justified in doing so in certain circumstances. None of the judges who gave evidence, they said, called this proposition into question and that ultimately any decision to legislate uh, would be uh, a political uh, decision. So what the uh, report authors seem to be saying here is that they're not questioning the possibility of Parliament legislating to reform or limit judicial review, but that whether or not that possibility is exploited is ultimately a political decision. Well, in its response to the independent review of administrative law, the government struck a rather different um, note. So I want to draw attention to two particular points to begin with, and that is to outline uh, what the government said about both parliamentary sovereignty and the rule of law. The government, it's fair to say, placed particular emphasis in its response on the notion of parliamentary sovereignty. It said that while the standard grounds of judicial review are default conditions that parliament intends or is taken to intend, to apply to the exercise of any power, these are just defaults, and Parliament is completely free to add to or remove them in particular cases. So it said that Parliament can add uh, duties to consult, to give reasons, to, 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 to conduct impact assessments, or to consider particular factors. 
And then it says that Parliament is also free to take away from these defaults, free, for example, to take away particular grounds of review. This means, for example, said the government, that Parliament could choose to create a body with plenary powers that isn't subject to review on the ground that its decisions are unreasonable or that it's taken into account irrelevant considerations or, by the same logic, one assumes, that is subject to any of the other grounds of judicial review. So, as we can see, on the one hand, Parliament places considerable emphasis on parliamentary sovereignty and on the facility this affords for Parliament to remove uh, requirements to abide by the standard that judicial review would normally um, cause to apply. At the same time, the government then turns to the rule of law. It says that this isn't to say, so its emphasis on sovereignty uh, isn't to say, that courts shouldn't have a role in developing the application of the rule of law in judicial review. For example, the government says, in the interpretation of statutes, the courts will assume that Parliament wishes decision makers not to act unreasonably and to be amenable to review on the grounds that emanate, it says, from the common law, unless the statute otherwise states. However, the government goes on to say it can't be emphasised enough that Parliament is the primary decision maker here and that court should ensure that they remain the servant of Parliament. This seems to reduce to saying ultimately that while parliamentary sovereignty and the rule of law are ultimate are both important constitutional principles, ultimately one is more important than the other. Parliament is sovereign. Parliament is the primary decision maker. The courts are the servant of Parliament, and by implication, the courts cannot. Uh, refuse to adhere to what Parliament has said in legislation uh, by relying on the rule of law or by relying on anything else. So at the end of the day, on this view, Parliament calls the shots. And to revert to an analogy I used in my previous lecture in this series, the sovereignty of Parliament on this view appears to be uh, seen as essentially a steamroller that is capable of putting to one side, of overriding anything that gets in its way, including the rule of law and the principles of judicial review that spring from the rule of law. Let me move on from those general points about the independent review and the government's response to focus on two particular uh, issues which emerge from the government's response. I'll turn towards the end of this lecture to the question of ouster clauses, but I want to begin with the concept of nullity. The idea of nullity means that unlawful administrative acts are generally considered to be void ab initio. What that means is that we, once a court finds that an administrative act is unlawful on any ground, we uh, essentially take that act never to have occurred and never to have produced uh, legal effects. A good example of this is the judgment of the Supreme Court in um, Ahmed number two. Now, in the prequel to that case, Ahmed number one, the Supreme Court had concluded that a piece of secondary legislation had been made unlawfully. It had been made outside the government's legislative powers. The government then went back to the Supreme Court in Ahmed number two and asked the court to suspend the quashing order in respect of this unlawful secondary legislation. The reason for that is that the government did not want the secondary legislation to lapse until it could be replaced with an alternative piece of primary legislation. 
but the Supreme Court said it couldn't do that. It said that the effect of finding the secondary legislation to be unlawful was to find that it was void ab initio. It had never legally, validly existed. And it followed, said the Supreme Court, that not issuing a quashing order, or at least not issuing a quashing order for the time being, wouldn't really change anything, because the unlawful secondary legislation would still be unlawful, it would still be void, because it had always been void. And the court ultimately said that to suspend a quashing order in these circumstances would actually be a disreputable thing for the court to do, because it would almost fool people into thinking that the unlawful secondary legislation was something other than unlawful. And the majority said the court should not lend itself to such a disreputable um, exercise. The constitutional and principled importance of this stance was underlined by Sir William Wade in an article uh, he wrote um, many years ago now in the LQR uh, on the notion of nullity and validity. He said that the whole basis of civil liberty is that the acts of public authorities are either lawful or unlawful. They're either valid or they're void. There would be serious danger, he said, in making the ultra vires principle discretionary. Administrative inconvenience, he said, should not be allowed to distort the law. So for Wade, and for many other commentators, the idea that unlawful administrative acts are invalid, they are void, and they can't be relied upon to produce legal effects, is a cornerstone of the rule of law. Wade calls it the whole basis of civil liberty. The government, however, in its response to the independent uh, review of administrative law, uh, envisages some significant changes in this area. In particular, the government has raised the possibility of uh, three uh, uh, approaches of, uh, suspending, of, of, of introducing the idea of suspended quashing orders, which is exactly the, the idea that the Supreme Court rejected in Ahmed. Secondly, of making quashing orders, at least in some circumstances, prospective only, so that they would leave in place the unlawful, for example, secondary legislation um, up until the date of the judgment and would quash it only for the future, thereby allowing that unlawful legislation to produce potentially many legal effects prior to the judgment date, and thirdly, and more broadly, dismantling the concept of nullity for most purposes generally, thereby enabling courts by, for example, withholding a remedy to, um, to breathe legal life, in effect, into what would otherwise be null and void. The danger with this, it seems to me, is that it allows the government to, to make secondary legislation which has no valid legal basis and which is then treated as if it were legally valid through the suspension or the withholding of a remedy on the part of the court. For as long as we regard unlawful acts as void, not issuing a remedy is ultimately neither here nor there, in the sense that, as the Supreme Court put it in Ahmed No. 2, um, not issuing a quashing order doesn't actually make any substantive legal difference, because the unlawful act is still unlawful, it's still void, and it's still, therefore, incapable of producing valid legal effects. Once we begin to unpick the concept of nullity, we begin to allow the unlawful administrative act to transmogrify into something that is essentially, to all practical intents and purposes, valid. Now, 
that arguably has some significant implications for the rule of law. The government says that actually doing what it recommends and essentially unpicking this concept of nullity would be a good thing from a rule of law point of view. Why? Because it says nullity is contrary to legal certainty, which is indeed an important aspect of the rule of law. This is because, says the government, nullity leads to a situation whereby an apparently valid legal act can actually be null and void from the outset. Well, that's certainly true. That nullity does mean that an act which is apparently valid, but is not, will be treated as having been null and void from the outset. And the government makes the point that this may cause uh, uncertainty, it may cause confusion, it may lead to a situation where many different things have happened on the assumption that the uh, unlawful act is valid, and then suddenly uh, the rug is pulled out from under everybody when the court tells us that actually it isn't and never has been uh, valid. And it's true that, that can cause a number of practical problems. But there is a different rule of law perspective that we need to keep in mind and which is really airbrushed out of the picture by the government in its response to the um, independent review. And this is concerned with the concept of government according to law or the principle of legality in its uh, most fundamental sense. Treating unlawful administrative acts as if they were lawful, which is what the government's proposals would effectively allow in certain circumstances, is contrary to the value of government according to law, which is itself a fundamental tenet of the rule of law, because it effectively would allow the government to do things or to be treated as if it could do things that it had never been given the legal power to do. And that arguably turns the principle of the rule of law on its head. Now, we don't know which, if any, of these options the government is going to try to introduce, and we don't know what the court's reaction would be if it did try to introduce them. But there are two key points, I think, that, that follow from all of this. The first is the very fact that the government is uh, raising this possibility uh, underlines the fact that it does see judicial review as being up for grabs. The concept of nullity, as it's currently understood, is an essential component of the law in this area, and it has fundamental constitutional implications. But the government is consulting on radical change, says a great deal about how it views this question as to whether or not judicial review uh, is something that can be uh, reformed or um, significantly undermined uh, should the government find it inconvenient. The second point is that this brings into sharp focus questions about the relationship between the rule of law and the sovereignty of Parliament. It brings into focus questions about what we mean by the rule of law, given that there are these different elements within it, the need for legal certainty and also the need for legality. And it raises questions about the balance that we strike between the rule of law itself and the sovereignty of Parliament. To what extent is it open to Parliament to reform the law in this area in a way that may be inconsistent, at least with certain aspects of the rule of law? Well, those questions also arise, but perhaps in an even more acute form in relation to ouster clauses. I want to finish this lecture by turning to ouster clauses. The ouster clause is a provision in an Act of Parliament that uh, says that something should not be subject to judicial review. If we take a flexible view of the Constitution, to go back to the term that I used in the first lecture, then we would say that Parliament is sovereign, it can make any law it wishes, Courts have got to apply any law that Parliament makes, and therefore Parliament can oust judicial review. In contrast, if we take the other view of the Constitution, the more durable view, 
we would say that some elements of the constitution are fixed, or at least cannot easily be cast to one side. Fundamental principles cannot readily be displaced. The rule of law itself requires judicial review, and that it follows from this that Parliament can't, or at least can't straightforwardly, oust judicial review. So taken in this way, the way in which uh, ouster clauses are approached by the courts casts quite a lot of light on this question as to which of these two views of the Constitution is the more accurate one. Against that background, I want to look at the Supreme Court decision in the Privacy International case. In Privacy International, the claimant argued that a tribunal, the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, or IPT, had misinterpreted legislation, and that by misinterpreting that legislation, the tribunal had gone wrong by incorrectly concluding that ministers could authorise computer hacking on what was called a thematic, essentially a broad uh, basis. And the claimant wanted to challenge this decision. It wanted to question the way in which the tribunal had interpreted the legislation. The problem was that Section 67.8 of the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act 2000 contained an ouster clause. It said that determinations, awards, orders and other decisions of the tribunal, including decisions as to whether it has jurisdiction shall not be subject to appeal or be liable to be questioned in any court. There was no possibility of appeal here, and so judicial review was the only potential route of challenge. The question then was, did section 67, subsection 8 of the Act, did it oust judicial review and thereby prevent any possibility of legal challenge to the tribunal's decision, and in particular to its interpretation of the legislation. It may be helpful to begin by uh, thinking about three different um, perspectives in relation to ouster clauses, and I, I base this to an extent on the judgment of Lord Sumption uh, in the Privacy International case. The first perspective is the radical or normative perspective. On this view, Parliament cannot exclude judicial review because higher law precludes such action by Parliament. This, of course, is inconsistent with the idea that Parliament is sovereign and it implies that in certain circumstances, rule of law considerations might trump parliamentary enactment rather than vice versa. A second perspective is the less radical or conceptual view. And this holds that judicial review is necessary to sustain parliamentary sovereignty. Now, this may seem counterintuitive. It goes back to um, an argument put forward by Lord Justice Laws in the Cart case. In that case, Lord Justice Laws argued that um, in order to be able to enact law that can genuinely be considered to be law, there must be a system of judicial oversight or curation that actually receives that law, can interpret it and can apply it in a consistent and principled manner. And judicial review, arguably, is an important component of that kind of judicial system. So on this view, you need to have a system of independent courts that can apply the things that Parliament enacts. If the things that Parliament enacts are to be worthy of being considered law in any meaningful sense. So, for example, you need a court to be able to make sure that, uh, that the law is being interpreted correctly rather than uh, a situation where courts are entirely closed out by ouster clauses. So on this view, a court could decline to give effect to an ouster clause 
and could argue that it was doing that in order to sustain the sovereignty of Parliament, to sustain Parliament's sovereign capacity to enact things that genuinely deserve to be called law. Finally, there is of course the orthodox view that Parliament is sovereign and is therefore entirely free to exclude judicial review. So what sort of support do we find for these different uh, views? Perhaps unsurprisingly, we find clear support for the orthodox review in the government's response to the IRAL report. The government says in its response that ouster clauses are not a way of avoiding scrutiny. Rather, there are some instances where accountability through political means are more appropriate than accountability through the courts. In this regard, says the government, ouster clauses are a reassertion of parliamentary sovereignty. They're a tool for parliament to determine areas which are better suited for political than legal accountability. And it follows, says the government, that as a core principle, ouster clauses legislated for by the parliament should not be rendered as being of no effect by the courts. So clear support there from the government for the orthodox view. What about the radical view? Well, if we go back to Privacy International, we can see that certainly Lord Sumption, uh, in his judgment, dismisses the radical view. He says that the rule of law applies as much to the courts as it does to anyone else. And under our constitution, that requires that effect must be given to parliamentary legislation, including, ultimately, even ouster clauses. Even Lord Carnworth, who, as we'll see, arguably gave the most radical judgment, um, certainly at some point didn't seem to be aligning himself with the radical view. He said that the court wasn't addressing the difficult constitutional issues that might arise if Parliament were to pass legislation purporting to abrogate or derogate from accepted rule of law principles. So certainly in this dictum, he seems to be suggesting that there isn't um, uh, any challenge to the sovereignty of Parliament in his view, um, and he therefore seems to be distancing himself from the most radical view. I'll suggest in a minute uh, that actually uh, there's a different way in which we can read Lord uh, Carnworth's judgment, but certainly on this uh, dictum, he doesn't seem to be uh, subscribing to the radical view. What about the conceptual view then? Um, Lord Sumption seems to accept it up to a point. He says that Parliament must intend limits on jurisdiction to be effective. In other words, he means that if Parliament creates a body with limited powers, it must surely intend those limits to be uh, respected and, to, and for courts to be able to enforce them. But then Lord Sumption ultimately seems to distance himself from the conceptual view because he says that Parliament can escape this conceptual difficulty if it uses sufficiently clear language. So this is what we might think of as a soft conceptual view. Lord Sumption is saying that we're entitled to assume that when Parliament creates a body of limited competence, it intends those limits to be effective. But if Parliament makes it clear enough that it doesn't want the courts to interfere, then courts shouldn't interfere. Lord Wilson goes further, and I think to some extent he does unambiguously uh, adopt the conceptual view. In other words, that there is a conceptual limitation on how far the court should go in upholding ouster clauses. He says that he may be willing to accept the conceptual impossibility of excluding judicial review of true jurisdictional errors. And we can see a similar approach, or certainly elements of a similar approach, in the judgments of Lord Carnworth and Lloyd Jones. What does he mean by a true jurisdictional error? Well, to borrow an example uh, in the government's response to the IRAL report, I think that what Lord Wilson means here is that if you have a tribunal set up to decide tax matters that then begins to hand out murder convictions 
we would say that it had committed a true jurisdictional error in that it had exceeded the obvious and explicit boundaries of its authority. And here, Lord Wilson says, even an ouster clause shouldn't stop the court from intervening. Let me return then to uh, Lord uh, Carnworth. Lord Carnworth also draws a distinction between excessive jurisdiction and abuse of jurisdiction. So to give the same example again, if we have a tribunal that's authorised to decide tax matters that begins deciding on people's criminal liability for murder, Lord Carnworth agrees that the court should intervene, even if there's an ouster clause, uh, when the tribunal commit those sorts of gross jurisdictional um, errors? What would be the point, he asks, of creating a body with limited powers if it could exceed them? Parliament, he says, cannot entrust the statutory decision-making process to a particular body, but then leave it free to disregard essential requirements laid down by the rule of law for such a process to be effective. But in saying this, he seems to me to be going beyond a merely conceptual limitation on ouster clauses. He seems now to be aligning himself with the radical view. Because he seems to be saying that it's not just that if the tax tribunal decides murder cases that the court should intervene, but that even if the tax tribunal is deciding tax cases, but is disregarding essential requirements of judicial review, such as natural justice or reasonableness, then the courts should still be allowed to intervene. So here, I think Lord Carnworth is going further than, for example, Lord Wilson did. While his stance on excess of jurisdiction, that is the tax tribunal deciding criminal matters example, while his stance there appears to be reconcilable with a merely conceptual limitation of ouster clauses, because ultimately it goes to the court's ability to interpret the governing statutes, his stance on abuse of jurisdiction, that is, not adhering to things like natural justice and reasonableness, that seems to me to extend into the radical or normative view. In other words, he seems to be saying that it just isn't open, or it may not be open to Parliament at all, to exclude judicial review on any of the range of matters on which judicial review applies. And I think that we can see uh, a reasonable, clear acceptance of that when Lord Carnworth says that it's ultimately for the courts, not Parliament, to determine the limits set by the rule of law to the power to exclude review. So he's not saying that Parliament can never exclude review. He's not saying that Parliament can't legislate on judicial review. But he is saying, that it's for the court to decide whether or not Parliament has exceeded the limits of its authority to shape the extent and the depth of judicial review. And that seems, to me at least, to be aligning himself with the radical view. Now, like I said at the beginning of this part of the lecture, these are not purely... Um, academic questions. For one thing, um, the independent review of administrative law and the government's response to it show us that ouster clauses and Parliament's ability to enact them and the court's response to them are a live issue. So too does the draft fixed term Parliament Act. Clause 2 of the Act essentially uh, reinstates uh, the prerogative power or appears to attempt to reinstate the prerogative power to dissolve Parliament, thereby abolishing the fixed-term Parliament regime that we've had since 2011. Um, it does that uh, by uh, creating uh, or reinstating a discretionary power to dissolve Parliament in Clause 2. And then Clause 3 goes on to say that a court of law may not question the exercise of 
or purported exercise of that power, or any decision or purported decision in relation to those powers, or the limits or extent of those powers. Again, we see here an attempt to oust the court's judicial review uh, powers. We see a pretty fulsome attempt, and it seems fairly obvious that this is uh, intended potentially to avoid the kinds of interpretations that we see in cases like Privacy um, International, where ultimately uh, the court, uh, in effect, read the ouster clause uh, down. I don't want to dwell uh, now on how a court might interpret uh, these provisions in the draft Fixed Term Parliament Act rep repeal bill. I simply give this as a further example of why this is a live issue and of the ways in which um, ouster clauses bring into such sharp focus these questions about the relationship between the rule of law on the one hand and the sovereignty of Parliament on the other hand. To conclude then, the government argues in its response to the review that ouster clauses should be effective where there is sufficient justification, and that legislation may be enacted requiring courts to give effect to ouster clauses in the absence of wholly exceptional circumstances, such as a collapse of fair procedure. What the government seems to have in mind then is legislation that will direct courts as to how they should interpret ouster clauses in other pieces of legislation. Will that succeed? Will it succeed where ouster clauses on their own have failed? Will courts take that kind of legislative instruction as to how they should be interpreting ouster clauses and will they yield to it? Or will courts stick to their view, as Lord Carnworth put it in Privacy International, that the rule of law ultimately determines the extent to which Parliament can intervene on matters of this nature? When those questions are answered in future cases, if they're answered in future cases, they will cast further light on the questions that we're concerned with in these lectures. To what extent does Parliament have a free hand? To what extent is the Constitution a blank page on which Parliament can legislate? Or, in contrast, to what extent does the Constitution, for all its flexibility, for all its unwritten nature, to what extent does it actually set parameters? To what extent does it have innate, inherent features that are either non-negotiable or are at least very difficult to change or get rid of. Can Parliament oust judicial review or are the courts within their constitutional rights to respond to such legislation in the way that the Supreme Court did in Privacy International and in the potentially even more radical way that Lord Carnworth hints at in Privacy international. There is no clear answer to that question. The matter has not been decisively determined by any judicial decision. But the fact that these questions are live ones, and the fact that there is not a straightforward answer, should at least cause us to consider and to wonder whether or not the Constitution really does adhere to the extent that orthodoxy says it does to this idea of an ultimately flexible constitution that is no more than the sum of the parts that Parliament puts in place at any particular point in time. Judgments like Privacy International uh, make us wonder, at the very least, whether there might not be a, a degree of constitutional bedrock which it is at least very difficult for Parliament to move.